Hi, good morning. I'm Kevin Gladwell. I'm a senior counsel with Turner Broadcasting. This is Devin Gordon, also with Turner Broadcasting, and we're here to talk to you today about common copyright issues that face nonprofits. Just a few uh, introductory thoughts before we get started on the substance of the copyright law presentation. Um, one is to talk for a second about the mission of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. As you'll see on the screen, the mission is to maximize the impact of pro bono engagement by connecting a network of attorneys with nonprofits in need of free business and legal services, free business legal services. Uh, if you're interested in uh, pro bono partnership and you're not yet a client, there are some requirements to becoming a client, um, you know, including things like being a nonprofit 501c3 organization, having some ties to the Atlanta area. So you'll see that information there on the screen. If you're not yet a client and are interested in uh, learning more about how to become a client, please reach out um, to PBPA for more information. So to jump into the substance of our presentation, we're going to talk a little bit first about the basics of copyright law. And you know, the slide we're starting with here is just a simple, some simple examples of what types of materials and works are subject to copyright protection. And so uh, at, at bottom, at the most basic, copy, uh, copyright protection is available for an idea that is expressed in a tangible medium. And so here on the screen, you'll see some examples, a thing like a photograph. So you have this photograph of this woman. So someone had the idea of photographing a woman um, in this setting. And once that idea is captured in a tangible medium in the form of a photograph, copyright protection affixes to that work, uh, the photograph, the, uh, the picture of the woman fixed in the tangible medium, which is the, uh, the image, the photograph. Same thing, music, another example. You have uh, you know, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen develops an idea for a song. Um, writes the song, either writes it on paper or sings it and affixes it uh, in a recording, a CD or you know, a, a computer hard disk, the way things work today. And uh, that idea, the idea of the song, once it's become fixed in the tangible medium, either written down on paper or captured in a recording, copyright protection affixes to that tangible, that uh, idea that's now fixed in the tangible medium. And so you know, as you look at the, the slide there, you'll see some other examples of works that are subject to copyright protection. Books, films, software computer code, once it's written and saved to a computer hard disk, a sculpture. And so all of these things are just you know, examples of ideas that have become fixed via the work of an author in a tangible medium. And that's the, the sort of thing that's subject to copyright protection. So moving on to the next slide, you know, just uh, a little more detail on what we just talked about. Uh, under default copyright law in the United States, Copyright protection affixes, it attaches to a work once the work has become fixed in a tangible medium. Registration is not required uh, for copyright protection to attach to a work. Uh, that happens automatically once the idea or, or whatever it is has been fixed in the tangible medium. But registration is advisable in many cases because it does confer some benefits on the copyright holder. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk for a second about uh, the rights that are embodied in a copyright. So you know, this is essentially the benefits of having a copyright, what it, you know, what it means to say I have a copyright. And what that is when you hear someone say I have a copyright or this work is protected by copyright, it means that the copyright owner has certain exclusive rights in that work. And they are those rights that you're seeing on your screen, the exclusive right to reproduce the work, to prepare derivative works based on it. And a derivative work is just... Uh, a work, a work that a a work that is a modification of an underlying work. So if you uh, if you have a song and someone else takes your song and incorporates it in there, so it takes a sample of your song, um, like it's popular in hip hop music, and incorporates it in a new song. Uh, if they do that without your permission, that's potentially a violation of your exclusive right to prepare derivative works, because they've now taken your work, created a new work that uses your underlying work, and that's what under copyright law is known as a derivative work. So uh, back to the exclusive rights again: uh, right to reproduce, exclusive right to reproduce, exclusive right to repair derivative works, exclusive right to distribute the underlying work, exclusive right to publicly publicly perform the underlying work, and exclusive right to display the underlying work. Those are the things, if you're the copyright holder, that you have the exclusive right to do with your work. So you now jumping back to the photograph example, if you're a photographer and you own the, own the photograph in an image, you control the exclusive rights. Based on you having a copyright in that photo, you control the exclusive rights to publicly display that photograph, publicly distribute it, to copy it, all the things that are uh, covered on this slide here. 
So to talk a little bit more about the uh, formalities of copyright law and uh, copyright registration, uh, if you want to secure a registration, you do so by going to the Copyright Office and filling out the necessary, going to the Copyright Office's website, pulling down the necessary paperwork, filling that out, submitting it to the Copyright Office, and paying the accompanying fee. So it's $65 per application to register a copyright, and uh, depending on the type of work, and again, registration is not necessary to secure the copyright protection, so depending on the, the type of work, um, you're automatically, the work's going to be protected either for the life of the author, plus 70 years, or for the shorter of 95 years from first publication or 120 years after creation. So um, just to split those two concepts up a little bit, again, the, the copyright protection affixes automatically once a work is created uh, in a tangible medium. So registration is not necessary to, to, to secure the protection or get the benefits of that length of protection. And so again, once you create a work in a tangible medium, uh, if it's created by you as an individual, it's going to be protected by copyright for um, your life as the author plus 70 years or if it's uh, a work that's created as a work for hire, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, the duration of the protection is going to be the shorter of 95 years uh, after first publication or 120 years uh, after creation. So that's the, the length of term. And then jumping back to the registration point, um, if you want to file a registration on that work after it's been created, it costs $65. And again, all the fees, um, the l detailed list of fees and the information about how to secure the registration can be found at copyright.gov. So to talk a little bit about um, the benefits of registration, as we just said, you don't need a registration to secure copyright protection, but it is advisable in some cases because it does confer some additional benefits. And those benefits are largely uh, procedural benefits that uh, would be of value to you if you were to get into a copyright infringement and litigation situation. And so one, having a registration is a prerequisite to, be, to bringing a copyright infringement lawsuit. So if you will, you're the owner of a copyright, Again, the copyright protection affixes and attaches to your work without getting a registration. But if you subsequently uh, notice someone out in the marketplace doing something that you took to be a violation of one of your exclusive rights, which we talked about a minute ago, to uh, pursue that violation as a copyright infringement in a court, you would first need to register your work with the Copyright Office. And so having that registration uh, is a prerequisite to a court allowing you to bring a lawsuit to enforce your exclusive rights in your work. And then the registration also confers some additional benefits uh, where you to get into a litigation situ situation. It allows you to potentially recover some additional types of damages and uh, allows you to avoid having to make certain um, showings about the validity of your copyright. The registration is, taking, is taken as evidence um, uh, as to the validity of your copyright and the work at issue. So that's basically registration in a nutshell. It's uh, not necessary to Secure copyright protection, but it does confer some additional benefits, such as being able to bring a copyright lawsuit and uh, giving you some advantages once you're in a copyright lawsuit. So to turn now to talk a little more specifically about nonprofit organizations and the types of works that uh, you most often see nonprofit organizations wanting to be copyrighted or you know, the, uh, the types of works that uh, nonprofit organizations are most interested in protecting under copyright law. This slide just shows some examples of the types of things that nonprofit organizations uh, create that are subject to copyright law. So promotional materials like brochures, educational materials like seminar handouts, event photos, websites and the materials posted to websites, uh, presentation videos that uh, your staff gives so that you might uh, engage experts to give on behalf of your organization, and then you know pr promote uh, promotional materials like commercials, that sort of thing. Those are all uh, works that end up fixed in a tangible medium and are therefore subject to copyright protection. So jumping to the next slide, we're going to talk for a minute about ownership of some of these materials like brochures and educational materials and commercials, that sort of thing, photos that your organization might have created. So under the default principle of copyright law, the ownership of a copyright in a work is owned by the author of that work. And so you know, just to give a few examples, if a photographer is at an event taking photographs, the default position under copyright law is that photographer, as the author of those photographs, owns the, owns the copyright in those photographs. Similar uh, for, for similarly for a song, uh, if a, uh, a musician is writing a song, the default position under copyright law is the musician who writes that song as the author of the song is the owner of it. So sort of sort of uh, apply that principle out to all different types of works we've talked about. If there's an author who drafts 
educational materials or um, a camera person who, uh, sorry, a, uh, uh, an author who drafts a promotional brochure, the author of that work by default copyright pr principles would own the copyright in that work. And so you know, the question is probably jumping to your mind as a nonprofit organization, if the author of these sorts of things by default owns the copyright in these works, um, what's happening when uh, authors are creating works for my organization? And you know, the, the question is, the answer is under default copyright law for the most part, you know, it's, it's what we just said, which is the author of the work owns the copyright in the work. The, the one exception which you may have heard about to that is what's known as work made for hire. And a work made for hire is a work prepared by an employee in the scope of his or her employment. And so if you have employees and those employees are creating copyright, copyrightable works as part of their job duties, default copyright law does provide those employee created works may be owned by you as the employer. But as we'll talk about in a minute, that's not as straightforward as it sounds. And in particular for nonprofits who, nonprofit organizations which tend to have smaller staffs and uh, use independent contractors much more often as opposed to having uh, materials created by employees just because nonprofits tend to have less employees. It can be a little risky to sort of assume that works created for your organization are going to be owned by your organization under the work made for hire doctrine. And so we're going to talk a little, a little bit more about that and what you can do to make sure that works being created by those that are working for your organization are in fact owned by your organization. So jump into the, the next slide to talk a little bit more about this uh, issue of uh, works made for hire and examples of those. Um, you know, there are some listed here. So uh, uh, if an organization employs software developers as employees and those uh, software developer employees are as part of their day-to-day -day job duties writing software for the organization, that software is likely going to be considered a work made for hire and by default be owned by the organization that is employed, employing those software developers. Similarly, you know, another example, uh, here with new, newspaper articles. If a newspaper employs a staff writer, so not a freelancer, but someone that's actually an employee of the newspaper, and that uh, author is writing articles for the newspaper as part of his or her day-to-day -day job responsibilities for the paper, it's likely that those articles are owned by the newspaper as works made for hire. And so, you know, again, as you'll see here on this slide, we're talking about employees creating works as part of their day-to-day -day job duties and not freelancers or independent contractors because uh, for works created by independent contractors or freelancers or others that are not um, creating the works as part of their core day-to-day -day job duties, those works are not going to be considered works made for hire. And it's most likely that, you know, to jump back to what we talk, talked about earlier, it's most likely that those sorts of works, works created by freelancers, independent contractors, folks that are not your employees doing their day-to-day -day job duties, those works under default copyright law would be owned by the author of the work, not the, the employer. I think we have a question. So the, the question was, what about volunteers? Where do they fit into this category? Are they are works created by volunteers, uh, quote unquote, works made for hire, or do they uh, fall into the category of works that are not considered made for hire and therefore own the copyright ownership vest in the uh, the volunteer who's the creator of the work? And the answer to that question is, uh, volunteers are not considered employees of an organization, and so works they create are not going to be generally considered works made for hire, and so. If you have a volunteer creating work for your organization in the absence of a written contract, which we'll talk about in a little bit, in the absence of a written contract with that individual that provides your organization ownership of the copyright, the volunteer would own the copyright and the materials. And so you maybe just pause on that for a second because it's really key to what we're talking about. If you have a volunteer photographer that is taking pictures at one of your events, even though it's your events and the photographs that are being taken may be photographs of your other volunteers or your employees or uh, those that are receiving services from your organization, under default copyright law, if the photographer is a volunteer, it is most likely that the copyright in those photos are owned by the volunteer and not by your organization. Um, so to, you know, to jump to the next slide, which is just an example of what we just talked about, it just means that you need to, as you are engaging individuals to um, produce creative work for your organization, you need to think about what that individual's relationship is to your organization. Is that person an employee? Are they an independent contractor that you've paid, but they're not an, you know, not an employee, but an independent contractor that you've paid to be there providing that service? Are they a volunteer? So again, not an employee. Someone is there providing that service and creating those works for you, but not you know being paid and not performing employee job duties for you. And if the individual who's uh, producing the creative work for your organization is not an employee, 
producing that work as part of their day-to-day -day job duties, again, it's very likely that the individual owns the copyright in those materials. So for you know, brochures, photographs, pamphlets, really anything under the, the sun that your independent contractors or your volunteers are producing for your organization, the default rule is that individual as the author of that work is going to own the copyright in the work. And so you know, to jump to the next slide, the key question then is, since nonprofits obviously use, are you know, heavily relying on volunteers and independent contractors, how does a nonprofit ensure that works created by those folks, uh, the copyright in those works, is transferred to and owned by the nonprofit organization? And the answer is contracts. Uh, it's a, a copyright assignment agreement. And so, you know, the way to handle this is to have an organization like a PBPA or your other uh, legal services provider draft an agreement for you with any individual that is creating work for your organization that transfers the ownership of the copyright in the work to your organization. And you know, it's really as it uh, it's really as simple as that. It's just getting in writing a statement from the individual that's producing the work that the individual is transferring ownership of the copyright in the work to your organization. And if you jump to the next slide, these agreements, which PBPA and the lawyers that work with PBPA are uh, very familiar with producing, they all sort of share some similar uh, common traits. And you know what they'll do, and this is just to give you a little bit of detail about what this agreement does and how it helps your organization. Uh, these agreements will contain a state, a, a clearly defined statement of the work at issue. So they'll define what it is that the uh, individual, the writer, or the photographer is doing for your organization and the types of works that that individual is going to produce. It'll designate the work as being owned by your organization. So it'll say that notwithstanding what default copyright law says, you and you as the organization and the individual producing the work for you consider the work to be a work produced for hire for your organization so that you own it. And it'll include some catch-all language that says, again, regardless of what default copyright law principles say, you and that individual is producing the work have agreed that your organization is going to own the copyright in the work. And then it'll, you know, as you see on the slide, include some ancillary provisions that say things to the effect of uh, the individual that's creating the work has not copied it from someone else and it's an original work so that you get you know attempt to get some assurances from the individual who is creating work for you that uh, again it is an original work and it hasn't been taken from someone else who might have an ownership interest in it and so you know those that's sort of the key basics of uh, how how uh, a copyright interest in a work is created and how you get that uh, copyright interest transferred to your organization. So just to, to recap quickly what we talked about, uh, for works fixed in the tangible medium of expression, copyright in those works affixes automatically. For the most part, that copyright, once it exists, is going to be owned by the author of the work. And so uh, you all as uh, executives or uh, leaders and nonprofits to make sure that uh, when you're engaging individuals to produce creative works for you to make sure that the copyright in those works are transferred to your organization, you need some sort of written agreement with the individuals that are producing works for your organization, which says that the copyright in the works those individuals create uh, are transferred to your organization. And so just to jump uh, quickly to one last slide that I'm going to present. Uh, this is, again, just talks a little bit about some of the formalities of copyright law, and particularly copyright notices. So you're probably used to seeing on websites or other materials, a little uh, C in a circle, along with a year and the name of the organization that has published the materials. And that's what's known as a copyright notice. Um, you know, stated very simply, that's just used to put others on notice of the fact that you're claiming copyright and the work at issue. And it's a pretty simple thing to attach to your works. Again, it's just copyright C in a circle, little C in a circle, the year publication of the work, and the name of your organization as the, the copyright owner. So for PBPA materials, it might be 2013 Copyright Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. And uh, again, this is just one of those things that confers some advantages on you as a copyright owner. It puts the world uh, on notice that you're claiming copyright ownership in a work, uh, which can be helpful down the line if you notice that someone is using that work in a, a way that you think is unauthorized. So that is the quick overview of copyright law basics and how to transfer copyrights in works that are created for your organization to your organization. And now Devon is going to uh, talk a little bit more about um, exploiting copyrights, and then also talk a little bit about rights of publicity. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so Kevin has now dealt with a number of the copyright issues relating to new works created by or for your organization. But I wanted to mention just very quickly a couple of issues that also go along with copyrights and third parties, owners of other works. So the first one we're going to touch on is copyright licensing. 
And licensing is basically granting or obtaining permission to use a copyright protected work of another party. And this situation arises in one of two ways, as the slide indicates. First, by needing permission to use copyrights owned by other parties. And second, by granting other people permission to use your works or works owned by your organization as a way to generate revenue or help other parties. Permission to use the works of others is very important because it is the way that your, your organization is going to avoid a copyright infringement situation, as well as it could be a workaround for a situation where an artist has created a work or an author has created a work and they don't want to give you all of the rights in that work, but they do want to allow you to use it. You can do a copyright license, which will take care of that. So to get that license, there are a few things that you want to look at in a license. One is you want to think about the scope of the license you're obtaining. How is your organization going to want to use the works that it's getting rights in? You need to make that scope as broad as possible so that when you later start using the work, you're sure to be within the scope of the license you obtain. The other important thing is the term of the license. Are you using this work one time, or are you going to use this work multiple times over a number of years? You need to make sure that the term and the license that you obtain gives you enough time to use the work in the manner that you want to use it. And the last thing I'll touch on with a license is exclusivity. When you're looking at a license agreement, you want to make sure that you think or give thought to whether you want to be the exclusive user of that work because you need to get that in the license. Otherwise, that author can grant a number of parties the rights to use those works, and you may be using a work and find out that another competitor or party is using the work as well, excuse me, as well, in which case you've got, um, you've got an issue on your hands that could have been dealt with in the license agreement early on. The other thing I'll say about licensing is don't forget that the the copyright works that you own or your organization own have benefit outside of your organization. Other parties may want to use your training materials across the country to do a similar, uh, a similar function to what your organization is doing, and you might want to give them that right to use those materials. It's also a way to monetize some of those materials if there's a group that wants to use use something that you've created, it could mean income to your organization, which for nonprofits is a very important part of what you do, obtaining money so that you can continue with the purpose of your organization. So that's something else to think about in the licensing spectrum. Um, moving on to the next slide, I, I just the second issue I wanted to touch on very quickly is copyright infringement. Basically, copyright infringement, in a nutshell, is the misappropriation or improper use of a copyright protected work that's owned by another party. We could spend an entire webinar talking about uh, copyright infringement and all of the issues therein, but I just want to make two quick points on that before we move on that are on the slide. The Copyright Act is a strict liability statute. What that means is if you violate someone's copyright, you are guilty of copyright infringement. There's no such thing as an innocent infringement, so it's not a defense that you did not realize that that copyrighted work was owned by another party before you used it. If you use it without permission, then you are a copyright infringer. So basically, all that to say, beware. Always secure the rights that you need to to ensure that you have the rights you need to have before using any work that could have a copyright that is uh, owned by another party. So moving right along, um, outside the copyright sphere now, there's one other related but different set of rights that Kevin and I wanted to cover today, and that's the rights of publicity, um, known simply in some circles as personality rights. Um, basically, this is a right of an individual to control the commercial use of their name, likeness, and image. So what does that mean? It's basically each of us as an individual has the right to tell other people when they can and cannot use our personal attributes in, for business purposes of their own. So in looking at rights of publicity, it really breaks down into three separate elements. First are the, is the use of the protected attributes, and courts are increasingly defining this as anything which can be used to identify a person. So we're not only talking about names 
or photographs, which are, are pretty obvious examples. But some of the case law suggests that signatures, a celebrity's voice that's very recognizable, slogans such as Here's Johnny from the Johnny Carson show. Um, it was used on outhouses and porta potties, and Johnny Carson was successful in getting that practice stopped in a right of publicity claim because it was a slogan that was attributable to him. So it wasn't a trademark claim in that instance, it was a right of publicity claim where he did not want his persona associated with these outhouses that, um, you know, that someone was using. So another example, but basically the question that you ask yourself in all of these situations is, is the attribute that I'm using sufficient to identify another person such that their rights of publicity are implicated and I need to get their permission? So the second prong, I guess, of what we're looking at in rights of publicity is, is it used for a commercial purpose? That would be, is, is that personal attribute being used on goods, merchandise, or services, or for purposes of advertising those goods or services, or for fundraising or solicitation of donations in some way? Because if it is, that is a commercial purpose that also implicates the right of publicity. And finally, the third prong is without consent. That's fairly easy in that definition and self-explanatory. But I will say consent is a complete and total defense to a right of publicity claim. So if you go out and seek permission ahead of time, you're in good shape. So the final, final note on this slide is just remember that works may involve one of two different sets of rights. There is a copyright, which Kevin's talked about, and a right of publicity, which we've just gone through. And a good example of that that we keep coming back to is the photographer example. If a photographer taking a picture of an individual, they will own the copyright in that photograph. But that doesn't mean that anyone with permission from that photographer to use the photograph is clear to use that photograph for all purposes because the individual also has their right to publicity in the use of their name and likeness. So in order to use the photo lawfully, you not only need the assignment from the photographer, which Kevin discussed, but you also need the right to use that person's name and likeness via a right of publicity. So moving to the next slide, where do nonprofits encounter the right of publicity issues? Anytime that you use the name and likeness of an individual for a business purpose, you need their permission because you are using their right of publicity. That can be use of a name and an endorsement on your website. If you've got a volunteer who wants to provide an endorsement, you need their permission to use that endorsement and their name on your website. Um, use of a person's image in a promotional brochure um, or on a poster or display or in some sort of promotional video. All of those implicate the right of publicity and you need permission before you do it. So on the next slide, the question is, how can a nonprofit address the rights of publicity issues? Uh, it's very easy. You get permission by use of a name and likeness release agreement. And as Kevin said, the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta and the attorneys that work with them have a number of these agreements that they've prepared um, for other clients and are very good at, at preparing those agreements. And once you have one, it's very simple to use each time you run into a right of publicity issue. So taking a look now at the traits of a good name and likeness release. Um, a good name and likeness release will provide you, the nonprofit, with the right to photograph, video, or otherwise record that person. Um, on Recording via a computer, recording via a smartphone, whatever it Whatever it is, the scope of that name and likeness agreement will give you the rights you need to record the person. It will also vest ownership of those recordings in you as the nonprofit organization. And this is safety to ensure that you don't run into a situation later where someone claims ownership in those materials or those recordings because they appeared in, um, in the recording and therefore want ownership of it. But it also would give you the unlimited rights to modify, edit, or otherwise alter the recordings as you want to do. And I point that one out because it's very important. Oftentimes we will edit videos and, and just put a snippet of the video or a person's statement on your website. Or we edit a photograph and put a new background in it to put it on a brochure. All of those are changes 
to the recording that was made and it's important that the person who signs over their name and likeness gives you permission to make those changes. Um, the final thing that I will mention here is that it will include a release of all claims for name and likeness or rights of publicity in the agreement so that all of the necessary rights are obtained and you are clear to use those recordings as you see fit. So in wrapping up the right of publicity issues, here are a few practical tips or pointers to avoid issues uh, with the rights of publicity. One is identify all personal attributes in the works that you intend to use. That way you know what you need to obtain permission to use when you go out and get the rights of publicity. When creating new works where people are going to be featured, it's a good idea to be upfront with them and tell them how their name or likeness can or may be used. That will give them the opportunity to object or raise any issues they have and for you to know going in whether you're going to be able to use the recordings that you make. Um, a third pointer would be to avoid using publicly available works where possible. Where you see people or individuals or personal attributes in those works that you would need permission to use. An example is pulling pictures off the internet. And I think we're all guilty at some point of grabbing a picture on an internet and throwing it into a slide or, uh, or throwing it into a brochure. But you have to be careful of doing that if you can't identify the person that's in that photograph and go to them to get consent. Um, you will want to try very hard to obtain consent from every individual who is pictured in a photograph or other work. And if you cannot get that consent, we say that you should seriously consider not using it. Um, all of the consent should be in writing. It's a great idea to get those in writing uh, via an agreement, especially as time passes because as you'll see, folks, memory fades, people leave your organization, you lose vital elements, and if you don't have these permissions in writing, it can be very hard to retrace it later and, and uncover it. And finally, I'll say that minors cannot consent on their own behalf. So if you have minors depicted in works, you need consent of parents, not just consent of those uh, minors. And we have a question. Okay. The question is, if you have a photograph or work that you want to use that is a crowd photo where there are a number of people in it, but the people are not identifiable separately in the photograph, do you still need rights of publicity issues? The answer would be, if you can identify a person, you do need their consent to use the photograph. If, they're, if folks cannot be identified in the photograph because it's at a, at a distance where you can't see it or you know it's kind of blurry and, and not in focus, you wouldn't need a right of publicity in that situation. Second, I'll say if it's in a public location where the photograph was taken and not at a specific event, then you may run into some, some other exceptions to the right of publicity, which we haven't dealt with today, but which may cover use of that photograph for a newsworthy purpose, for instance. If you're going to put it in a, you know, a newspaper and you take a crowd shot out in public, then you're in good shape there, too. So um, moving to the next slide, we've, Kevin and I have put together a hypothetical that we're going to go through just to kind of highlight some of the copyright and right of publicity issues that we've dealt with today and hopefully give you a, a real time example of how this may come up with your nonprofit organization. So as we go through this hypothetical, please take notice of the chat box on your webinar screen and feel free to send us comments on these hypotheticals. We'll pause for a moment when we ask the questions to see if we get any answers that we can uh, read for the webinar before moving on through the information we want to cover on the hypothetical. So with that in mind, we'll start with the hypothetical. Nonprofit employee Sam is cleaning out an old file drawer as nonprofit prepares to move to a new office building. He runs across a set of fantastic photos taken at a charity event nonprofit hosted several years ago. He thinks to himself, these photographs would be fantastic to include in the brochure we're putting together for our annual fundraising gala. Sam sets the photographs aside, intending to begin incorporating them into nonprofit's gala marketing campaign. 
So looking at the first question from this, should Sam use the photographs? So we'll give you just a moment to see if we get any comments, and then we'll provide our thoughts on that question. The second question is going to be what steps should be taken before the photographs are used. All right, so let's see if we got any responses. One person has said, should the photographs be used? No. And the answer to the second question is, Sam should contact the individuals in the photographs to get their permission. All right, so. Several others still typing, so keep typing. All right, if you're still typing your answer, feel free to type your answer. It seems the. The consensus we're arriving at is there are some steps that need to be taken before those photographs are used. So to answer the first question, should Sam use the photographs? Sure, why not? But he needs to make sure that those photographs are cleared first. Um, instead, uh, steps that should be taken before the photographs are used. Kevin, I don't know if you want to talk about that or um, if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, it seems like the uh, the individuals who are writing in that uh, Sam should contact the photographer, if he knows who that is, and potentially contact the individuals depicted in the photos to uh, try and confirm that uh, those individuals will sign releases granting Sam's organization the right to use the photographs with respect to the photographer, the right to use the you know the the uh, the photographs and make sure that the the photographer is not going to claim that. He has a copyright ownership interest that prohibits that. So basically, Sam would be calling the photographer and asking the photographer if he hasn't already to sign a copyright assignment agreement that uh, transfers ownership of the copyright in the photos to Sam's organization so that he has that right cleared. Uh, and then also trying to reach out to the individuals depicted in the photographs and them to sign rights of publicity releases that confirm that uh, Sam's organization can use the likenesses of those individuals as, to, as included in the photos. Uh, for his organization's materials. That's that's the right steps to take. And for those that were getting that right online, thanks for paying attention and staying awake. That's great. <laughs> um, so, really, so really, there's, in summary, two steps. You know, we're, we need to look at who owns those photographs and are there people in the photos where right of publicity may be implicated. Do we have anything else from the online chat session? Um, there's just a comment that you... What about, can you include the logos and other property owned by others as part of this process if you were going to, um, maybe you want to identify, the photographer might want to be identified as the photographer but give you the right to use it. Okay. How yeah. that work? So the question is, if we're going to use this photograph, can we modify it or put other elements in, other trademarks or your organization's marks or identify the photographer who took the pictures or maybe edit the photo, take out a background and add a different background or something like that. Um, those are all rights that need to be clear and, and concise before you do that to the photograph. So you want to get the photographer's permission before you change that work, um, change the photograph, because as Kevin mentioned earlier, that implicates a derivative right issue. You're preparing a new work based on that underlying Photograph. So it's an issue where you need permission before you do it to make those alterations. And if you don't have permissions, go back to the photographer again and say, here's how we want to use that photograph. Do we have your permission to do so? So looking, moving on to the next slide, this hypothetical uh, plays out. So we'll see how what happens next. Having attended a high quality webinar hosted by Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, Sam realizes several days later that he needs permission to use the photographs he found in nonprofit's upcoming marketing campaign. Worried that he may not be able to use the photographs, he quickly returns to the file cabinet drawer he was cleaning and he locates a photographer agreement which assigns all rights in and to the photographs from the photographer to the nonprofit. Shoo, thinks Sam, I'm glad to see this. Reassured that the rights in the photographs are cleared, Sam sends them to the nonprofit's printer for scanning and inclusion on posters and brochures. So the question is, because Sam found the copyright assignment agreement from the photographer, is he now free to use the photographs? Is he in good shape? So we'll give the folks online a moment to put in their answers in the chat box to that question, and then we'll provide some guidance on that.
So do we have any? I have some folks taping. All right. So we'll wait another minute. Yep. Is there a statute of limitations or something that might prevent the use? Is one of the questions. Another comment is yes, provided the specific use of the photograph is covered in the assignment agreement. Okay. All right. We've got two observations online that are both good stepping off points for the discussion. Um, one of the questions is a statute of limitations. Someone noticed that these were old photographs that were found in a, in a file drawer. So are we dealing with any timeline here uh, in use of the photographs? As Kevin talked about early on, the statute, uh, not the statute of limitation, but the length of a copyright ownership is somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 120 years, 75 years. It's a very long period of time, depending on the nature of the work and how it was created. So unless the photograph is that old and you're outside of that timeline, then the copyright is still owned by someone, and that will not get you out of the situation you're in. Uh, the second, second comment that we received was to look in the photographer's agreement to see if there's anything in there that would suggest that you have the right to use the photograph. And that is a good observation. At times, some of those agreements will include a statement by the photographer that they've obtained all the necessary name and likeness rights for the photo that's been used. And you can rely on that. Although, you have to be very careful in relying on statements like that in a license agreement without having a separate right of publicity agreement because you are then relying on the photographer to obtain those and obtain the necessary permissions and that's not always best case scenario. Um, so I would say you still have a missing step here where you want to go back and identify the people in the photos, see if you can obtain those rights of publicity from those individuals and if not give serious consideration to whether or not you're going to use that photo. I don't know if Kevin had anything else to add or? That's really it. I mean, as you guys are probably uh, beginning to glean from the presentation, a lot of this really is, you know, for Sam anyway, a lot of this really is just a dot connecting exercise. It's looking at the photo and saying, all right, there was a photographer that took this photograph. Do I have an agreement with that individual that says my organization owns the copyright in the photograph? And then there are individuals depicted in this photograph does my organization have something in writing from those individuals that says I can show their name and likenesses as included in this photograph within my organization's material? So it's just really just a matter of saying, looking at the photo, identifying the individuals that were involved in creating it, the photographer and those that are depicted in it, and connecting the dots and making sure that all those individuals have signed agreements that give his organization permission to use the, the photo. What about if you contact the photographer and they say, I'm not going to assign the rights to this, but I'll, I'll let you use it. Is you know, I guess, what kind of agreement would you then enter into? I think you may have discussed this. And is that what would be the analysis for the organization and thinking through whether that would suit their purposes? The question is, if you do contact the uh, photographer who created the photograph and they will not sign over, assign you the copyright and allow you to own the rights to the, the photograph, but are okay with you using that photograph for purposes of, of your uh, marketing campaign or whatever use you're wanting to put it to. You would need a copyright license in that instance, which is what we had discussed uh, previously, uh, with keeping in mind the scope of the license you need to obtain to get the rights for using it in the manner you want to use it, and the term. If this is going to be a five-year marketing campaign, don't get a one-year copyright license, print all your materials, and then realize a year later that you don't have a license to continue using that photograph. Um, so those are some issues and analysis that you need to go through in that instance in order to use that photograph. So let's turn to the last hypothetical screen now to see how this entire our situation plays out, which I hope demonstrates to you all some of the dangers that you might face. Lillian Dugooder is opening her mail and realized that she received the fundraising packet from her favorite charitable organization, Nonprofit. She opens the envelope, excited to learn of what great things the group has done this year and to see what Nonprofit plans to tackle in the coming year. The annual fundraising gala is always the highlight of her year. To her great surprise, 
Her photograph is featured on the cover of the brochure with a bold caption that says, Support Divorced Single Parents and Join Us for the 2013 Nonprofit Gala. Featured prominently on the inside of the brochure is a glowing endorsement of nonprofit, which Lillian submitted via their website at last year's gala. Lillian is distraught. Will her friends and co-workers, who also support this nonprofit organization, believe she has gotten a divorce and is in need of help now? So this kind of shows you the way this situation may play out if you use these photographs in a way that wasn't intended. You end up with very unhappy people on the receiving end of the use of this photograph. So let's look at the questions here. What are Lillian's rights with respect to the use of her name and likeness in the marketing campaign? What steps should nonprofit have taken before using the photograph? And what can nonprofit do better the next time? So we'll give everyone a moment to chat their answers to those questions, and then we'll talk through the rest of this hypothetical. <laughs> and while everyone's typing, I will say that this did come from an actual case that is currently pending in court, and we'll talk about about it uh, when we get done because it, it does have some grave raise some grave concerns uh, for your organization. means her image cannot be used for a commercial purpose um, without her permission. Nonprofit should have secured her permission. Um. So we've got a couple of people who have chimed in and suggested that Lillian's rights are her right of publicity or right to approve the use of her name and likeness before it's used in a campaign. Uh, of this nature because it is a commercial use of her name and likeness without her permission. So that's exactly right. That's Lillian's rights and you know Lillian has a cause of action now against the nonprofit for using her name and likeness uh, without her permission. So what steps should nonprofit have taken before using the photograph? Kevin? So in my mind it's really two things. One is you know as uh, you out in the audience have identified nonprofit should have secured a uh, appropriately drafted name and likeness release uh, from Lillian uh, that you know confirmed that she was granting the nonprofit the rights to use her name and likeness uh, in its promotional material. So that you know that's the legal bit. They should have, as we've discussed, should have gotten the contract with Lillian that uh, granted them the rights to use her name and likeness in these materials. And then just you know, in the relationship and sort of being a good citizen piece for a campaign like this, where you know Lillian is focused on, uh, and there are some words being attributed to her in. Uh, materials that are being sent out to the public. It also, I think, would have been a good idea for the nonprofit just to call her and, you know, notwithstanding whatever contract they had, just give her a call and let her know that this was going to happen and uh, confirm that she feels okay about it. And she's obviously a volunteer, has a relationship with the organization, and I'm sure the organization wants to uh, keep that good relationship in place. So it would have been a good idea just from a relationship perspective to have a conversation with her before uh, creating some materials that use her. And I'll say uh, that also highlights the importance of the scope of the release you get uh, from the individual. You need to be clear how the photograph is going to be used on the front end so that if there are issues, that individual can go ahead and, and express those issues going into it. So that's, that's why we highlighted earlier, you got to be clear up front how those photographs are going to be used so that the release is going to hold up when you do actually use the use the photograph. The other thing I wanted to note is the endorsement on the inside of the brochure was one that Lillian had put forth via the website. Um, this is a situation that a lot of, of nonprofits may run into and some that I've dealt with in Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, which is the terms and conditions of use on your website when someone is putting forth their uh, endorsement should cover 
allowing the nonprofit to use that endorsement in marketing materials. So it's a good idea to revisit some of your website terms of use or conditions of use to see that you're obtaining those permissions because you may need to add, add or update the language in the terms and conditions to reflect that you have the right to use the materials that someone submits, whether those are photographs of an event and you're soliciting, you know, upload your photographs to our Facebook page or upload, you know, your endorsement to our website. If your terms and conditions are such that it gives you permission to use those, you may be covered by that without having go, to go back to that individual at a later time. So just something else to think about in that, in that hypothetical. So with that, I think that that covers the hypothetical. And as I told you, it's based on a real case that I believe came out of New York where a photographer took a picture of a friend of his who happened to be uh, an, an ad sales individual and later, many years later, sold that photograph that he took of her to Getty Images. Huge photo house that collects photos and sells them or relicenses those photos to other groups and organizations. Long story short, she opened a magazine that some of her clients advertised in to find her photograph in an ad for HIV positive individuals who have rights. She had not given her permission when that pho photographer took her photograph to use her name and likeness or give a name and likeness release. Getty did not obtain that from her before they relicensed the photograph. So while they had permission from the photographer to use his photograph, they did not have her name and likeness release. And she is now in the process of having to go through a lawsuit to sort of unwind that, you know, the, the right of publicity issues there. But the problem was very, it was very focused in her industry because her clients and individuals are opening this magazine to see their own materials and found her picture and that information about her. She was not an individual that was HIV positive and, you know, had not granted permission to be used in the campaign. So these are real issues. It's not something that necessarily is, is something we've made up. I mean, this was taken from a, from a real case that's, that's going through the motions right now. So I say that just as, as a fair warning uh, on how important these issues are. So that, um, I guess the takeaway points we have on the next slide, Kevin, if you want to do those. Yeah, sure. I mean, the takeaway is just, you know, we said it a few times now, which is uh, identify the individuals that are involved in creating materials for your organization. So if you're talking about written materials or a, a photograph, you, you may have a photographer in play. If it's written materials, uh, you might have a, a writer or an author or a marketing person in play. So identify those individuals that are creating materials for your organization and make sure you have appropriate written agreements in place with those individuals that transfer ownership of the copyright and the materials to your organization. And then for uh, any individuals who are depicted in materials, so have their uh, names or likenesses used in the materials, make sure you have appropriate uh, written agreements in place with those folks that give you permission to depict those individuals in the uh, materials your organization is using. So again, it's just uh, you know, identifying the folks who are involved in terms of the uh, the copyright owners and the individuals that are depicted in materials and getting written agreements in place with those individuals that allow your organization to uh, use the materials the way you intend to. So with that, if there are any other questions, please type them into the chat box at this time and we'll give you a minute or two to ask any follow-up questions. We've dealt with some of the questions as they've come through, but uh, if there are more, we'll take those at this time. And while you guys are typing, the one thing we'd add is, uh, you know, don't be shy about reaching out to PBPA. As Devin has mentioned, these issues are, are live issues for uh, big companies out in the real world. And so if there are, you know, large companies with big legal departments struggling with these things, it, you know, obviously means they're complicated. And so if you have questions, that's why PBPA is, you know, here and they're here to help and have experts on this stuff. So don't be shy about getting in touch with them. There's a question. What compensation should be given to a volunteer um, to get the assignment? And then the okay, so the question is what compensation should be given to a volunteer to obtain uh, the rights to their work uh, via a copyright assignment? Um, I think the compensation can be nominal. There needs to be some type of compensation just so that there is a, a arm's length transaction between the two individuals to obtain that, but they're volunteering for your organization. They understand that the um, the works they're creating are going to be used by the organization. So I don't think that the amount 
you know, if compensation has to be large or any at all, if they're willing to give that work or, or provide that work free of charge. It's really just a matter of making sure they are on board with giving you the rights at whatever price you feel like is fair. If it's a photographer who's volunteering their time, it may be that you pay them $50 to come out and work at your event and assign the rights to you and the photographs they create because that would be reasonable to provide their time or compensate them for their time. Uh, whereas if you've got someone coming in for you know multiple weeks to work on a book for your organization, it may be that it's more fair or reasonable that that price is a little higher. Or if it's a one-time uh, you know service that they would normally charge 10 or 15 dollars for, maybe they'll just donate that to you. So I think it's it's on a case by case basis what you would expect um, in the way of compensation for those volunteers. Yeah, so if you have a celebrity who's going to volunteer some time or you know, otherwise participate in an event in an event for your organization, the it, that can get complicated, frankly, because as you've identified, um, as the as the questioner identified, the question was sorry, I should have repeated the question. The question was if you have a celebrity uh, volunteering or participating in an event for your organization, uh, what sort of issues might there be with pre-existing contracts that an individual has that might prohibit the rights they can grant you, or otherwise uh, affect how they can be involved with the organization? And I think the short answer on that one is that can get complicated really fast because most um, big name celebrities are likely to have some existing endorsement deals and other relationships with uh, outside parties that might affect how they can participate for your organization. And you know, the best thing to do in my mind in that situation is to get in touch with PBPA and just have a conversation about what you're looking to do and you know potentially have a conversation with your celebrity and just ask some of these questions. You know, are, are they comfortable with the way you're asking them to, them to participate? Are they comfortable with the plans you have for including them in? Uh, photography sessions or other materials and you know just get their thoughts as to whether they have uh, any existing deals with other parties that might affect their ability to do what you're asking them to do. All right and that's about all the time we have for questions today so thank you guys for your time and uh, for your participation in the event. The final slide says if you need more information uh, here are the ways to contact the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta uh, and Certainly, none of what Kevin and I provided today has been legal advice, but it's just merely um, informational for you so you know the right questions to ask when you do seek the legal advice. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.